It's time for Screen Junkies Movie Fights. Oh, what in the world? We are doing this, you guys. Happy 4th of July. It's America's birthday. Happy birthday, America. And there's no better way to celebrate than with a Last Fighter Standing Movie Fights Throwdown. <laughs> Wow, uh, we have assembled uh, just a collection of movie fighters that is going to make you crap your pants. It is so good. And uh, hashtag movie fights live, hashtag movie fights pre-recorded. It's a very special America's Birthday edition. Uh, and the last fighter standing today will walk out of here with this thing, the Movie Fights Championship belt. <laughs> Oh yeah, and uh, just a, a couple of notes. Oh, real quick, gotta give a shout out to Owl Nation, uh, Percival in the house, hoot hoot. And uh, I will also say that uh, the next movie fight, so you know, this is our last weekly movie fights, then we are moving to monthly. Our next one will be the movie fights from San Diego Comic-Con. That is always epic, such good times. And then, New show programming, a little switcheroo. Honest trailer commentaries next week will be moving to Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m., all right? So Honest Trailer commentary is coming. And if you're a member of Owl Nation and you want to keep uh, track of that, we are going to be dropping the Owl Nation podcast, myself and Lon Harris, so check that out wherever fine podcasts are sold. But it's free, so just, yeah, do that. All right, so here's how this is going to work. We have assembled the greatest movie fighters from the show's history. It is nuts. And it's going to, so you can see them all spread out there on the couch. Look at that array of talent. Make some noise! So, here's how it works. Three competitors will be randomly selected and they will enter into the round. The winner of that round remains and it's like a king of the mountain. While two losers are gone, two more will come in and then the winner of that round will stay and we'll keep going. It's gonna be rinse and repeat for basically like five rounds. And then in the final round, we'll pick the two top fighters. One will be eliminated and they'll go into a speed round, best of five. And whoever gets three points of those out of those five questions gonna win this piece of hardware oh yeah um does that make sense yes no don't worry you'll figure it out happy birthday america have a hot dog drink a beer it's gonna be a good time strap in and helping us decide all of this we have lon dan calling lon harris and daniel radford oh, yeah, buddy. Some regulations, how this is gonna go? Oh, some okay rules. <laughs> uh, instead of rules, you want some out. regulations? Lay it all out for us. Oh, I th I thought I just did. No, no, no. <laughs> in, in, in incredible detail. Yeah. Oh, um, hey, Lon, I just want to let you know we're all counting on you. Thank you. There it is. You there it is. There there it is. Um, and uh, yeah, Danielle. So you are not. Uh, there is no live poll today because we are pre-recorded. Yeah, sorry to people, but please keep following on the Movie Fights Live hashtag. We will be going through and checking them and talking about all the stuff. So please, it's a really exciting. Episode and we hope that everybody gets to participate in the hashtag. I don't know why I brought my laptop. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, you know, in the mix we have so many great fighters. We have Dan Merle, the current movie fights champion. He's gonna be randomly in the mix. The belt is on the line. Yeah, there he is, Dan the man. Uh, this is some good stuff. Uh, you know what? Let's see who our first three fighters are going to be. All right, I'm gonna pull them out of a hat here. Whoa! We have Ace Cabrera! Oh, yeah. Squad leader Ace. Sitting next to Ace Cabrera will be my biological father, Scott Mance. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. You got on camera Doesn't matter. That energy, the master of the speed round, Koi Jandra. Oh my god, you are starting with a bang! Look at this guy! Before I ask question number one, uh, JTE, can you drop that sick ass package? Ladies and gentlemen, no, it's main event time. Thank you, Thor. All right. <laughs> so, 
before I ask the question, uh, here's how it works. I will ask the question and then shout out your answers like we're in the speed round, and then we will fight regular movie style. There's no time movie fight style, no time limit. So shout out your answers, I will write them down, and then we'll fight it out. Okay, here is the question. Question number one. What is the best movie that bombed at the box office? Blade Runner. Fight Club. I'll say Children of Men. Blade, that was my second guess. Blade Runner. Fight Club from Koi. Ace has Children of Men. All right, fight it out, you guys. Okay, so Blade Runner, which came out on June 25th, 1982, <laughs> cost about uh, $35 million to make, made about $28 million at the box office. This movie just has, has nobody was ready for it when it came out in 1982. And Harrison Ford, who was very famous and very popular because of two Star Wars movies and Indiana Jones, and Ridley Scott, the director, his previous film, Alien, was a massive, massive hit and a very in, in, influential movie. But Blade Runner, nobody knew what to make of it based on a short on a, a story by Philip K. Dick, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? It was too cerebral, it was too esoteric, it was too ambiguous, and it just didn't do well. People didn't know what to make of it. There was a boring narration. But then over the years, they took away the narration, and people started to discover the movie on home entertainment, on VHS. And then people realized how influential it was. You saw the impact of Blade Runner in other films like Strange Days, Children of Men, and uh, and the revamped Battlestar Galactica. It is the most influential science fiction film ever made, even topping 2001 A Space Odyssey. I, I, I tend to agree that it has a lot of influence, but the movie itself has a lot of flaws as well. I mean, you mentioned a lot about why it didn't connect with audiences. The reason why is because it was very slow and it's very boring. A lot of current audiences that watch, new generations that watch Blade Runner now appreciate the cyberpunk genre, appreciate the new kind of genre, the new sci-fi feel that it introduces into new movies, like a Blade Runner 2049, but the original itself is still very slow. It's still very, you know, hard to get into as far as a, a story itself. What about uh, it has a lot of, You're it has a lot of problematic issues as far as Harrison Ford connecting. Yeah, it has a lot of problematic issues as far as his relationship in that movie. I feel like Children of Men is one of the most current sci-fi movies as far as what the themes that it's dealing with. The, the initial principle of a sci-fi movie is to show you issues that come up in our world now and what could happen to them in the future. As far as immigration, as far as refugees, that's what Children of Men is all about. And that's what we're seeing nowadays. And that's what makes it a powerful sci-fi movie. Not just that, but the shots in this movie are absolutely incredible. It's one of the greatest shot sci-fi movies of all time. There are multiple wonders in this movie that just take you far back. The wonder inside the car, inside that car chase scene is absolutely incredible. I feel like Children of Men delivered something that's so ahead of its time that I feel like 10, 20 years from now, we're gonna be looking at that movie as another influential movie, not just because of what it did and what it continues to do, but what it initially did when it first came out in theaters. I want to talk about a movie that has its time. That is, of course, Fight Club. 1999's Fight Club cost way too much to make. It almost tanked a studio. No one knew what to make of it. No one knew how to market it. And that movie is still one of the most misunderstood films because it appeals to both the highest and lowest common denominator of society. The people that liked Fight Club for the fights didn't get the movie. The people that liked Fight Club for the anti-capitalistic nature, for the actual subtext, for the actual way it sees the world. We're living in a nihilistic society in that film that actually doesn't feel like nihilism in the cliche thesis Fight Club color student way. We're living in a world that actually exists today. We've had all these problems that, that Fight Club kind of prophesized way back 20 years ago, and the ramifications of that film still hold up. The way David Fincher's developed his style really took off with Fight Club for me. David Fincher is inarguably one of the best directors of our time, and Fight Club to me was him using all of his powers. The way he used CGI to blend things that couldn't be done with actual practical, but you don't feel like it's CGI. The acting in that movie is incredible. It's Brad Pitt at his best because Brad Pitt is a character actor trapped in a handsome man's body, and he gets to be a character actor trapped in Tyler Durden's body. It also is one of the rest, best representations of toxic masculinity in that it is a character who actually represents what men want to be in the 90s, and it destroys all problems. It has all of the subtext of both of these films, but doesn't have the pacing issues, has a great soundtrack, is greatly directed, and it's Ed Norton and Brad Pitt at their best. And about a minute Morgan left, about powers. a minute left, you guys. Is it, okay, is it? okay. first of all, first of all, you're, you're breaking the two rules. You're not allowed to talk about Fight Club. <laughs> Second of all, for you, without Blade Runner, 
there would have been no Children of Man. There's sure, no way. Wait, hang on. The best hang movie, on. Wait, not just a minute. The most influential. Just, I agree. Blade Runner is, is very influential. The Blade Runner is the best movie because it was so influential. But because you're saying that it was boring, it was it was slowly paced. But the last half hour of that film was nonstop action. It had the greatest score. One of the greatest scores of any movie by Vangelis or Vangelis or however you pronounce his name. It is a great score, and the movie asks well, very very relevant that. themes about what does it mean to be human. There was always the question about what. Whether or not Deckard was a replicant, Harrison Ford was a replicant, a question that they still answer. And Harrison Ford is Deckard. He was a great anti-hero. About the 30 seconds great. left. I remember moments of Children of Men, but I mainly remember that one sequence. It's not an overall film. It's a lot of Agreed. tones. I enjoyed the tones of that film. Blade Runner certainly has moments, and it definitely is influential, but there's a reason it has Dude, 87 you cuts. Said, you the said, 87 cuts of that movie show that it wasn't a complete film. There's a reason it didn't do you, well. It had to be remade. You said and it for tears me, down Brad Pitt's character. Remade. I feel it like it glorifies sequelized. Brad Pitt's character. The whole movie is a glorification of Toxic. If you're watching it's it's absolutely. Glor- people Club want to not- be Tyler Durden. Wait, that's, but, but people want to be essentially what it created. The it problem, created the problem with the time. Time. Yeah. There it is. <laughs> do, do do androids dream of electric se- sheep, and uh, will Scott dream of what he did not say at the end of that oh. round? Uh, we all dream through those electric Lon, sheep. anything factually you, uh, you want to add there? I think it's Vangelis, but the internet is very back and forth on hard versus soft G. All right. Vangelis, Vangelis, <laughs> I don't know. Um, Lon, thank you for that. <laughs> uh, all right, so uh, I'll, I'll, chi- I'll chime in on this first. Uh, three great answers. I felt like uh, Scott Scott got dinged, um, and uh, and there weren't a lot of dings on uh, Coy and Ace here. But the, uh, just as far as uh, the, it being a slower paced film, and uh, the pacing maybe being a problem because it is a throwback to the noir style, and I feel like that does um, I don't know that is kind of a mixed bag pacing wise and. I heard just more points. Scott, I feel like you relied a little too much on the the influence and the history of the film, whereas these guys hit more tangible bullet points. As far as the full package, just as far as the influence, the themes of the movie, and uh, the individual scenes, uh, I heard just by a hair ace uh, with Children of Men for me. Um, but uh, Koi had a powerful argument as well. But I'm going ace. Uh, Lon, who do you got? Interesting. Uh, I, I agree. I thought Mance, uh, of all three, has my favorite pick. But I think he did a great job of arguing why it's most influential as opposed to the best. So it really came down to Koi versus Ace. I, I, I got to disagree a little. I thought Ace came out really strong with a great sort of opening about uh, all the great aspects of Children of Men. I thought he did a great job talking about how, you know, cinematography is so amazing. But I thought Koi just, with the complete package, it was a really, he gave a really interesting, robust, very thorough uh, sort of statement on why Fight Club was so ahead of its time. I think I'm going Koi. All right, it's 1-1, Danielle Radford. Um, sorry, Mance. Once again, I love like you're you're so good at the dates and the numbers and the everything, but I think that sometimes that winds up taking too much of the argument um, instead of doing uh, major the points, and you did wind up being too much about the influence. So for me, it was also between those two, and. I have to agree with Lon just by a hair because there were a few more specificities. I don't agree in real life, but in this fight, I have to say I have to go with uh, with uh, Black Hollywood Live Zone. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right, Koi, <laughs> you, you take that round. You are the king of the mountain for this round. Ace, well played, Scott. Hey, Dad, I hope you're not mad at dinner tonight. Uh, it's okay, son. He just got back. Back. He's already in the dog house. He's on the couch back from oh, the cage. Good stuff. Oh. All right. Man, so, it's so, too bad he won't yeah. live, but then the again, bar? who does? Yes. All right, so. We're not right. supposed to like Tyler Durden. He's the enemy. <laughs> Scott Mance, no worries. You can beat traffic. Okay. <laughs> I love, I love you, Pop. All right. So, um, again, there are no points giving out, given out. It's just you stay on, and whoever's on at the end gets to go into the speed round for all the marbles uh, to the top two. Who will Koi face? First off, Juan Harris. Come on down. You're the next contestant on Hashtag Movie Fights Live. One dollar. Oh. <laughs> and. Do I go here or here? Uh, wherever you like. Wherever you like. And then. DJ Woolridge! 
All right, some whoa, whoa. formidable foes. Hey, formidable so, foes. So I saw this on the shelf, and like we're all counting on you. So I want oh, to thank you. Uh, I just wanted to let you know we're yeah, all counting we're all on counting you. Counting Roger, on you. Is, is this show brought to you by Airplane? <laughs> yes, Roger, Roger. Uh, what's your vector, Victor? Okay, let's. Get question number two. Again, call out your answer, and we'll go from there. Ooh, okay. Happy prep. Uh, this is a good one. Happy prep. What is the best non-MCU superhero movie? Spider-Man 1, Sam Raimi for Spider-Man. The Dark Knight. Blade 2. Yeah! Okay. <laughs> do I win? Yeah. How's that, do I win? Uh, Okay, so, uh, and uh, Koi, you had Dark Knight. Yep. No! And then Lon with Blade 2. Yeah! Okay, fight it out, friends! All right, so Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 1 is the movie we'd already had Blade, we'd already had X-Men, but Sam Raimi's first Spider-Man movie was the movie that launched superhero movies as we know them. It took the best elements of past uh, superhero movies by perfecting the origin of Peter Parker. We'd already seen the origin story done in Richard Donner's Superman. Spider-Man perfected that. We'd already seen a movie done with style with Batman, Tim Burton. Sam Raimi, Spider-Man perf perfected that as well. By the way, you might have heard the bell. Thank you, Ed Greer, for stepping into Lon C. <laughs> Nailing it yeah. already. Hopefully people will realize how difficult that job it's is. It's so okay. else There's a lot going on. Dark Knight oh. was the first film to show, much like we've learned with the Netflix series, that your hero is only as good as the villain. The Dark Knight was able to give us both the, in my opinion, definitive take on the Joker because it was like nothing else we'd ever seen. Mark, Mark Hamill also, <laughs> uh, Mark Hamill also right there. I'm giving Mark Hamill some love theatrically. We'll go okay. live action. I think Heath Ledger's Joker really transcended the medium. There's a reason it's the first one to get a major Academy Award nod and win. There's a reason that film is taken so seriously. There's a reason Chris Nolan has spoken in all these circles, and there's a reason that we see the Dark Knight trilogy for what it is. Batman Begins is a great start. It really escalates and turns into Dark Knight, and Dark Knight Rises is certainly not a part of that trilogy we talk about well. The thing that Dark Knight did was it painted a picture of an actual police procedural drama and put Batman in it. That is not a superhero movie. It's more than a superhero movie, and that's why it's the best out of the MCU. It's arguably better than the MCU cumulatively because it showed the MCU how to do it right, and Batman has never been more Batman. The Joker has never been more Joker, and there's Two-Face. Everything about the movie is everything we love about the Dark Knight, and it's perfect. Dark Knight is a good Joker movie. I mean, yeah, the, the Dark Knight, the Dark Knight called... it, it is a villain showcase. It's absolutely a superhero movie. Where there's nothing procedural about it. There's no procedure. It's just a bunch of random incidents happen that Batman has to go like sort interrogation of interrogation scene. Oh, but there's no police investigation that you're following. Oh, what, 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 what is the investigation like? Oh, I bet there's some ships we better go look at. Oh, I bet Joker's about to show up at this party. Like the police are pawns. It's not about them doing a great job. Like of a comic Investigating. Book. Yeah, it's right. exactly like a superhero comic book story. Whereas one film is a comic book superhero story. It's also a horror film, and it's also a great Guillermo del Toro movie, and that's Blade Two. What these films don't have, these films have great directors that have taken their style and made it very subtle so that they can service this very well-known, famous story. Spider-Man doesn't feel like the definitive Sam Raimi film, and Dark Knight doesn't feel like the definitive Christopher Nolan film, but Blade Two is very immediately recognizable. It has monsters, it has a creepy, very thoughtful and carefully built-out world that it takes place in, it's got supernatural feels. It's clearly a Guillermo del Toro movie. It's about feeling different. It's about feeling isolated. It's about feeling alienated. And and, and it works perfectly well as a superhero comic Listen, film. nobody's connecting to Blade or, or Christian Bale's Batman and those movies as human beings. I remember as a young man How going into you? theaters, seeing Spider-Man 1 and seeing myself reflected on the screen, somebody struggling with becoming adult, somebody struggling with finding romance, which is the key of Spider-Man, which is why Spider-Man is so appealing it's and so most, universal. I, I, I agree. Loved. That's, that's why we Whereas Man. both both Dark Knight and Blade treat their characters with such a distance that it's more about the movies themselves, about the characters, it, and, and, and putting yourselves the within those movies. It's you, the most cookie cutter high school. We've seen that done better in Spider Man Homecoming. Yeah, the like, Spider Man Homecoming fixed that movie. It, right. and and that's that's like, Spider Man Homecoming made Spider Man Tony Stark's teen sidekick. Spider Man is a supporting character in those movies. But Spider Man Homecoming <laughs> takes Spider Man and actually makes Peter Parker's high school relatable yeah. and feel lived. It also cast 30 year old CW yeah, actors. Uh, Spider-Man. Oh, Tom Tom like yeah, thirty in high school, and so did like Flash Thompson, who was this. Like, he was a thirty-five-year-old wandering the high school hallways. I never bought that Spider-Man. Yeah. Same Raimi. We look at it with nostalgia glasses, and I agree. I dive rewatch. It's amazing. Yeah, it's no. fine. Guillermo del Toro made a great Guillermo del Toro movie, not a great Blade also, movie. All, like of throw points, this out there. all of your points, I think, work against that film because I never felt like I watched a Blade movie. I felt like I watched Blade in a Guillermo del Toro movie. About a minute left. About a minute left. Willem Dafoe is so great as the Green Goblin. He's able to uh, project.
act through that silly mask. Whereas, thank can you for you bringing even up that Power Ranger name suit. the villain and in... scrying. Yeah, you didn't even know the villain. That's it, right? The main villain in Round Zero. The main villain in the Blade Two villain. The main villain in Spider Man One was a Power Rangers villain. They wasted Norman Osborn. They wasted casting Willem Dafoe. You're just about the villain. It's not even a super. The Dark Knight. The Dark Knight could represent both Batman and. The Joker. That's the beauty it of the title. It can represent the Joker. It can represent. It's a movie about a villain and how you take care of that villain. It's escalating. Thirty from Batman seconds. Begins. The end of Batman Begins set up the Dark Knight beautifully because of escalation. So yes, it's a movie about a villain. You know what else did that great? Infinity War. Why is that a bad thing? Is a beautiful film that lands that beautifully. Whereas but, Sam Raimi Spider Man is a Sam Raimi movie that uh, limps along. Also, also, also Spider Man is a movie that's able to stand on its own. It's not a sequel. It, it, it's a, you, you can, can watch, watch it completely independently. But it has two sequels. What are you talking about? Yeah, but it's you don't need those two sequels to watch the first one. You don't need Blade One to see Blade Two. Like, oh, this guy's a vampire, but he also kills vampires. Done. All right. Wow. How about it? That was a barn murder. Okay, Danielle Radford, uh, what are you thinking about this one? Again, these were all fantastic arguments. I'm very glad that Tony didn't jump up and beat down somebody. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe very happy. Got, got a little spicy. Dude. I like Far From Home a lot. <laughs> 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 I haven't seen it yet. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, so Spider Man Homecoming and Far From Home is Tony Revolori. as the arguments go. Um, all of these were these were great arguments. I think that DJ, unfortunately, um, sometimes you would undercut yourself by talking about how great Spider-Man was, but not necessarily great how great Spider-Man was in the movie. And you would mention how William Defoe had to overcome the mask and some of the silly stuff. And for me, I felt like that kind of undercut your argument. Um, with, uh, with Coy's argument, Man, I, th that was one where every time you would love one that I would be like out of the park, Lon would catch it like one handed. Um, as far as like, you know, talking about how it's procedural, and he mentions that there isn't a really any procedure. Both of them dinged you on it's a good supervillain movie. Um, so on that, I gotta go with Lon. All right, that's one. That's one for Lon. By the way, yeah, I love the Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Is fantastic. He's so yeah. good. These are why we have jobs. Like, we all <laughs> right. We're trying to ice skate uphill. Is what <laughs> <laughs> Some of our jobs are there. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, what, uh, are there facts in there? No. Uh, <laughs> and scrying, uh, look it up. I <laughs> think, you know what, overall, I mean, the, the, the weird part is, Koi had the best movie. But I don't know, yeah, maybe not best argument in regards to, yeah, the procedural jazz. Like, oh, I was with you, and then like, he puts together a bullet with the help of a supercomputer, and that's about it. <laughs> He's got that bullet, you know what I mean? And he, and he has some donuts with some cops for no reason. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, yeah, I, I don't like that, that sucks. Um, so, and, and Blade Two being such a, um, yeah, a, a tour movie. You know what I mean? Uh, I, I that was nice. That was nice stuff. But DJ, I gotta say, I think DJ talked a lot about why Spider Man, why that's the best non MCU because it really kept to the character. He got some good points in about like it, it's not beholden to anything. It's not a sequel. So I got a break from the pack and go with DJ. Okay, uh, no that's, pack, that's just me. Just, uh, <laughs> <laughs> really not bad. Uh, or we're, uh, uh, you're not a pack. Yeah. We're, we're, Damn, one, so? we're one wolf. Okay, it's fine. <laughs> Okay, uh, so it's uh, one for Lon, uh, one for DJ. Uh, yeah, th there were these were great choices, great arguments all around. But the one that I heard the least, uh, um, just powerful takedowns against, that at the same time had a very strong opening salvo and argument throughout. Uh, I gotta go with Lon Blade Two, that he just came out the most unscathed, um, whereas everybody was just throwing hay. Makers, but Lon came out that's a little bit the cleanest. So, Lon, you are sticking around! Woo! DJ and Coy! All right. Well played, Lon. MCU films, uh, yeah, They probably are, right? I, I can't think of them. All right. So, let's see who's going to jump in these hot seats. No First off, oh, we, uh, we were just talking about him. Tony Revolori! He loves Spider Man, he hates Peter Parker. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Greg Alba, where oh, are you yeah. at? Oh, 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 yeah. Heavy oh, yeah. Hitters, baby. We are not messing around. Oh, I'm heavy. 
Yeah. Can I hit her? I just said you're a heavy hitter. Oh, oh man. Oh, oh, cool. Is there a pen? I feel like I a Here you go. Here you go. I do the just <laughs> one approach of maybe five switches. Right. Choose the most outrageous thing. All right. Who has it's the bathroom, bathroom key team. now? Because now uh, <laughs> yes. I'm being punished. We really want to be on camera. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, Greg Alba, you've never held the movie fight's title, but you have held the bathroom key for this building for the longest out of any Yeah, life. now I'm suffering for it. <laughs> Which man has it right now? All right. Why don't you check your pockets? Here we go. Question number three. Okay. We ask, what is David Fincher's best film? Social Zodiac. Network. Okay, I heard uh, Zodiac. What, yeah, what was the other Greg? one I heard? Social Network. Oh, Social Network. Okay, okay. Social Network from Tony and Lon. I'll go, uh, I'll go seven. Okay. Which one's that? Seven? <laughs> 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 Sasha's All got right. I, I was on that plane too. To, I'm live. You are bringing it. Uh, <laughs> I got one fan. Okay, so uh, we have seven from Lon. We have a social network from Tony, and from Greg, we have Zodiac. Uh, gentlemen, uh, let's fight it out. Zodiac, uh, with David Fincher, he always likes to explore a lot of the psychology of things, and especially with the serial killer element. And you know, Lon even brought up the movie Seven. What I love the most about Zodiac is how human the film is. It's not really about the serial killer so much. It's more about our obsession with serial killers, and that's kind of a brave topic to actually explore. I can't tell you how many people I know just like look up true crime and love to investigate these sort of things. And you watch these characters with like Jake Gyllenhaal, Robert Downey Jr., Mark Ruffalo. You're seeing their personal lives deteriorate over the course of the film just because of their one obsession with a real life serial killer. On top of that, too, it's even though it's a quiet film, it will still have this like haunting score and it'll be the most beautifully scripted film out of any of his movies. And the production design of it, he brings that era to life and you feel how the world is being affected there. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's just a super thrilling film. Yeah, I mean, it's a serial killer movie, but that's really not, as you said yourself, it's not really about the serial killer. It's about, like, how slow and painful a slog it is to try to un to try to crack a mystery like that. And I so it's kind of an unsatisfying movie. I mean, that's kind of the whole point. I it's watching these guys ruin their lives in this investigation that maybe ultimately doesn't matter. I sort of agree. It's kind of like a takedown of the true crime genre, whereas Seven is sort of the iconic serial killer movie that all the other serial killer movies that came out in the later 90s and the early 90s were all trying to like rip off and get back to what Fincher did with Seven. I don't. I disagree completely that the movie is, a, is like a slow, boring film it's at like, all. It's, I mean, it's, it's not, a slow burn to it's a, it's, a, it's a character study of it. Your movie also has Kevin Spacey in it. And, you know, it does have Kevin Spacey. It has Spacey. Kevin it Spacey have, in yes. and, uh, well, but he's it. Well, but it was the first movie to figure out who put Kevin Spacey in, but then don't credit him. He's yeah. not in the credits at all because they already knew Priya Actively, don't put that guy in the credits of your movie. That's you're going to want to take him out later. So it's actually very forward thinking. And with Social Network, I feel like that's more oh, no, like the, 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 Aaron, the Aaron Sorkin script is more of the highlight for that movie than it is more of the, the direction of David it's Fincher. Andrew Kevin Walker, not Aaron Sorkin. Andrew Kevin Walker. Correct. Oh, yeah, my bad. Yes, I was thinking of the, the Danny Boyle. Tony, we'd love, to, we'd love to hear some thoughts. No, uh, I, I just want to let them fight, and then I was going to come in. And, oh, and sure, yeah, yeah. No, 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 but I, I think, okay, you were saying it's more of a human story. This is about, uh, uh, the social network was about as human as can get with a guy trying to create Facebook, and, and making that mm -hmm. story appealing is incredible. Yes, he's made two films about serial killers, but let's be honest, the best serial killer film of all time is Silence of the Lambs, which every film is trying to live up to, albeit it's different. So I'm saying, uh, uh, albeit, but I think Seven is better than... Uh, um, Zodiac. 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 Zodiac is my movie. Sorry, Zodiac. Yeah. <laughs> Zodiac, because I do agree that like this is just watching people fall into the that obsession and whatever. But that's Seven relatable. Seven is a good though. movie, but I think what makes Social Network uh, uh, David Fincher's best movie is not only from every line of dialogue that you can just remember and you're hooked from the second it starts uh, to Jesse Eisenberg's pitch perfect uh, uh, performance as um, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, I think it genuinely sets it off. And I, you have I, a, a possibly Oscar winning performance from Justin Timberlake. Someone who really had never won. But do we need a humanizing I, story about I, I these so. guys, I these do, awful guys I do, who I feel like America? I also feel like How the did they ruin America? But that's the point. Facebook? The I mean, we're going to go back and like make a great movie about them. How wonderful it is that there's but never, Facebook but, 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 no, no, but they never undermine elections and democracy. 
spy on I'm sorry, whoa, 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 let's take that out because that is not that's a part not of this film. Mar that's <laughs> the part of the film hey, that I'm talking about. Hey, I answer about. Kevin Spacey is in my movie. You don't have to answer that Facebook is a social Mark, media. The Mark Zuckerberg performance, too, the thing well, I have I mean, in issue. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the very, Spacey and, the, and, uh, and Facebook's dealing with bots or whatever. Well, so that's that, that's, that's we're all, all not going to influence. That's all not going to influence. We're very familiar with the Mark Zuckerberg personality, and I think Jesse Eisenberg fails to actually portray that. When we have when we have Mark Zuckerberg's personality all over the internet, and then you see Jesse Eisenberg, not he's, just, time. he's just not, doing not, the not Jesse the Eisenberg personality, though. He's not doing Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, I would disagree. I think we, uh, yeah, you're saying we knew what, what Mark Zuckerberg's personality yeah, was. Yeah, like a whole bunch of interviews that we would well, see I mean, on the we internet had, all the time. Not, not the general public. And yeah, he's kind of wooden. He's a little wooden. But, but I mean, yeah. that's still Jesse he's not Eisenberg. He's a likable lead, either. But that's the point. He made a story with an unlikable lead, and you still kind of want him to succeed. And 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 um, yeah, which is uh, that's, uh, that's I, think I think both of your movies <laughs> are more. I think both of your movies are more of a good observational piece. Whereas I think Zodiac Seven? actually puts you into it. Seven's a lot more, more emotionally. You connect more with Seven than you do with Zodiac, which is very much a. I don't length, really connect with two detectives. detectives. I connect more connect with connect people who follow about serial killers left. than I do connect with two detectives. No, I'm just saying like, you would like, connect with the people who are trying to who are living through Facebook and showing your relationship and how you grow and how this started. Not only do you get more information from actual real life, but now you're now you're also like I mean, figuring out. It's very fictional. I mean, seven is what you were saying. I mean, I mean, it's, it's it's definitely up. more real than than a serial killer or people falling, you know, into massive well, you're, despair. You're, you're, our movies all deal with obsession. Well, your movies are based on truth. Our movies, movies deal with obsession, yeah, and right. I think out of anyone not, that deals with obsession, this is the one that is most relatable in understanding the mindset of people who do fall down that path. I mean, uh, yeah, I, mean, I don't seconds. know anyone who would ever fall down that path that far. But, but Seven is also a movie about people who become undermined and who it ruins their mind. They, they become so fixated on solving this case, but it does it in a more engaging, emotional, entertaining the, way. The characters in, in, in The Social Network all interact so beautifully and so realistically, more than any of your two films, that they just... I don't know. It's, it's a, I it's think a, it's it's a great I movie. Do. Oh, I completely disagree. Time! Woo! <laughs> all right, man. All fantastic movies. Yeah, all yeah, three of these movies, movies are freaking yeah. great. Yeah. All great movies. Uh, so much uh, good stuff right here. Uh, you know, th th it... At the end, uh, Lon, uh, your argument against <laughs> um, against uh, Greg that didn't really feel like a takedown. It was just like kind of a summation of like the tone of his film, and I didn't feel like so that uh, takedown didn't quite work for me. Uh, so at the end of the day, I heard the most individually about their movies from Tony and Greg, and we looked the most and alike at it. <laughs> 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 Brown and curly hair. <laughs> A couple of handsome fellows down in the end there, and just uh, right here, man. Right here. <laughs> uh, at, at the end, I thought uh, Greg's <laughs> opening salvo, and then uh, how he parried throughout, uh, took the day for him uh, in my book. So I'm going with Greg and Zodiac, even though Tony had some wonderful stuff to say about Social Network. Lon, I like your choice as well, but uh, Greg, uh, Ed mm. Greer. I think I'm gonna break away from the pack. No, uh, <laughs> no, 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 I'd like to go with you. One thing we learned, um, Ed doesn't know the no, no, no. pack means. <laughs> um, let's see, I, you know what, these, you guys, I see why you guys always say, oh, great arguments all around, because guess what, there were. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I really, and this is the best of the best, so obviously it's gonna be that way. Personally, I gotta say, I like Seven the best, but taking that out of it, I like what Tony was saying about the filmmaking mastery it would take to make somebody like Zuckerberg appealing as the main character of a movie. And I think the only the only things that the Lon did to knock Alba out was just the jazz about it being like a unrequited hmm. story of finding the dude. Mm -hmm. If I'm gonna watch a movie about finding a dude, you better find the dude. <laughs> <You're>, <laughs> so so I gotta go with Tony. Okay, uh, so it's one for Greg, one for Tony, Danielle. All right, so with this one, I felt like part of this fight got way too into the weeds with, you know, for a while it felt like it was a like best serial killer fight, and like that was what the fight was about, and then it became about things which is like, you know, other stuff besides yeah, what's in the movie. Yeah, let's remake Seven with Christopher Plummer. <laughs> it's like, you know, I, I felt like there was a lot of time. We have two minutes to be up here, we're doing our best. <laughs> Because of that, I felt like wow, a lot of the, the 
specific Thank arguments you. about the movies were what lost. I, I do agree, you know, and I was going in one direction, but Lon did have that great takedown of if you're gonna, if, if this is a movie about finding the guy, I wanna watch you find the guy. And so um, it was between uh, Greg and Tony for me, because I felt like they had, were really specific about their movies. Lon wound up knocking Greg out, so I'm going with Tony. Oh. Boom, oh. Tony Revolori, oh. stick around, brother. Nicely done. Uh, Greg and Lon, great choices. <laughs> Being here, fellas. Oh, don't forget to clip Bye. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I, I feel like I, I, I let them so knock each other out. out. Yeah. yeah. You let them, they, they punched each other out. No, yeah. yeah. Just just came in. Like, Hi, guys. So it had to be revealed. Boom. Yeah. Yeah. Forget about it. Yeah. yeah. You took the damn yeah, thing. Well played, <laughs> my friend. I it's way too much power. Yeah, All right. It. Okay. So let's hmm. uh, find out. It's round number four. Who will be joining Tony Revolori up here in the hot seats? First off, uh oh, here he comes, Dan. Oh, no! <laughs> oh come on! Oh yes, uh, this th this right here belongs to Dan, but it is on the line. It's anybody's ball game right now. And in the third seat, come on down, Cameron Rice. Oh. All right. Okay, gentlemen, I will ask the question number four mm. and uh, just shout out your answers. Oh boy. Okay, it's a fun Jeez. one. Uh, what movie character would stand the best chance to win the Hunger Games? Grab a Hulk. Okay, we have the Hulk. Uh -huh. uh, you said Wolverine? I said Wolverine. Wolverine. Tony? Mark Super. Zuckerberg. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> Superhero. <laughs> Correct. No. Uh, what movie character? What movie character? Yes, we have Wolverine, Hulk. Okay, Wolverine, Hulk. Um, I have no idea. Lon, you make great choices. Choose for me, bud. <laughs> oh, all right. We'll allow it. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> okay, we... And we'll go right, should I pick nine? I would say, I would okay. say Superman would be a good choice. Yeah. <laughs> all right, I'll... I'll I'll go Superman. Okay, <laughs> great. <laughs> Thank you, Lon. <laughs> All right. So. You want to phone a friend? <laughs> you know what? Last man standing rules apply. Okay. Uh, oh, uh, figuring them out as we go along. <laughs> so uh, we have Wolverine, Superman, and Hulk in the Hunger Games. Fight it out. Who would be the best? I, I'm sorry. Can I just like ask uh, uh, what's the setting, or does that matter, or are we arguing our own things? Here's the like, literal you know? question. Okay. Sorry. Um, sorry. sorry which I get which Hunger Games it, it, dome is it? Jungle? Desert? Is it snow? What? Because like we can all, put, all of our characters can break out of it. So that's all I'm just saying. Like we can go all. Oh, so it's the gonna... standard Hunger Games. You know, they go, have go, go, those go, go, bees go. that are tracker jackers or gotcha. whatever the hell that is. Go, 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 okay. go, 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 go. Uh, <laughs> that's a good so, poll, Hal. Thanks. Thanks. Again, the question: What movie character would? Stand the best chance to win the Hunger Games. And I'm assuming it's just our three characters at the end. Anyway, let's go. Let's go. Okay. Sorry. Wolverine, <laughs> Superman, yeah. and the Hulk. We can keep Katniss in there. <laughs> yes. See how she um, does. I mean, there's literally nothing that can hurt Superman. Um, besides magic, which is obviously something he doesn't have any resistance to. None of these characters have any magic in them. The the man can fly into the sun and become uh, Superman a million, come back and destroy the entire planet, even without doing that. So, And he can survive in the atmosphere so there's none of these characters that can stand up to him. Surviving in the atmosphere and flying into the sun, not good skills to have for the Hunger Games. And he does have another weakness, that would be kryptonite. And what can you do if you're in the Hunger Games? Rich people from outside of the world can send things into the Hunger Games yes. to help influence the outcome. And who's richer than Lex Luthor? You know he'd be sending kryptonite arrows to every single other person. Well, the number one thing, the number one thing, because I, I love that we brought in the rules of the Hunger Games. Well, First of all, you have the opening ceremony. And who's going to dress the best but the Incredible Hulk, as we saw in Thor Ragnarok? He's I'm coming sorry, in I'm sorry. with the crown. Ken He's got a Henry Cavill with his shirt. Off. This isn't Henry no Cavill. Clothes. This isn't automatically Henry wins whatever <laughs> dress concert. No. Thank you. But so, and he is the most handsome guy we in Superman. this cast. We as well Henry as Cavill. He is very likable. The Hulk as the Hulk. If he's Bruce Banner, maybe. But he's still nerdy, and people don't really root for him. He is the person. He is the tribute that everyone sees, and when they fight, Superman is that tribute. So of course they're going to be paying for him. As much as Lex Luthor has money, I'm sure a bunch of other people would be sending Superman, and he doesn't even need them if they give by the way I don't know if uh, uh, Wolverine or
or Hulk know how to fire an arrow or even use kryptonite. Wolverine or is a hunter tracker. Willing, he's an outdoorsman. He, I feel like he's too prideful. <laughs> I think he's too prideful to even want to use. This uh, is that five uh, um, years between uh, Endgame, Infinity War and Endgame. This is when we're getting kind of smart Hulk, but he's still a little angry, a little powerful. He knows how to shoot an arrow. And also, not just, I'll help you help you with the Superman. I'm going to help you with the Superman thing a little bit uh, over here. Is that what? If Superman, it's all about computers and all that stuff, too. That's how they work. Brainiac in the computer. He's screwed. Not just like Luther's okay, going to so Richard Pryor. Brainiac Brainiac with the computer. I'm just you saying, I'm just saying, if we're adding yeah. supervillains, yeah, then yeah. let's add William Stryker. Let's add uh, every other supervillain. <laughs> let's add a normal you. man. <laughs> 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 so William Stryker can't get into the Hunger Games. But Games. he can send stuff like a, a gun with a silver bullet, and Superman can go, bam, boom, you're dead. He's a werewolf. He can smell Superman coming. He can hide in the trees. But Superman can fly at the speed of light. Like, there's, it doesn't matter if, if Wolverine like cannot uh, match his speed, his strength in any way. Yeah, same with the Hulk. The Hulk can maybe match his strength. Maybe. He's strong as there is. He's, yes, in, but, in but the, the better Hulk gets, the dumber Hulk gets. And that's where you can exploit that's his That's okay. Exactly. He grabs both he by the legs like he did mistakes. Loki and just smashes them around for a bit. I'm sorry. So it doesn't but, matter. He's going to brush himself off and be what else you got. Oh, there's not a quick brush off. Wolverine does get knocked down in the films. He might wake up healed, but he does get knocked down. He will wake up healed. Hulk will not. You snickety snicked right into the Hulk's heart, he's also, not going to wake I'm up. Hulk saying, heals. Superman can reverse time. He can see through adamantium and sees a weak point in the joints and be able to like figure out every counterpoint to be able to beat the... And, and if, Wolverine if you, doesn't need to cheat to win. He doesn't need to reverse time so he can win straight out. Well, then if you're out. saying that, then he wouldn't use a kryptonite that they send him in the tribute. That's not cheating. Then, well, That's not cheating. That is fair play. That well, is according same, to the rules of the Superman. game. Superman. Superman's a smart character who knows what to do and be able to manipulate things. And he's Superman also, would never shoot someone with a gun. He's Superman. <laughs> Well, then he'd use the bullet, put it on his finger, and just jab his finger that's in his brain. Thing. That's well, that's, and that, that's going to be the same. biggest problem. That's that's doesn't matter. Superman. If, if they're fighting to the death and Superman has to do this, this is the, like we're not talking about their character. If they're fighting to the death because they have to well, fight to the, the problem, death. Well, that's the problem, though. Superman doesn't kill, so therefore he, it's going to be like PETA. He's not going to kill anybody, yeah. and they're all going to have he to live together. I'm sorry. We're, 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 saying, like, no, no, we're the, better than this. Humanity is better than this. And Wolverine would shoot him with a kryptonite arrow while he's doing this. I'm just saying none of these guys have the strength to shoot a kryptonite arrow at the speed that he can't dodge at. Not if he, but Superman has faith in people. That's his weakness. That's what but he's always exploited. But he knows in. these two people. One is Wolverine a crazy, to good, brain guy interested. who does nothing. Does and, nothing. And, and like, like legitimately couldn't do it. And, and Wolverine is again, if he goes into berserk mode, maybe he's a little bit stronger. But again, every every <laughs> Superman has his strength and speed to counter anything and everything they do, even with outside help. Well, he's got the skills for the seen, Hunger Games, but it, not the killer instinct for the Hunger Games. And but if people, Wolverine but has, it doesn't matter if rich people put in there. If rich people can sense that, over talking guys. Rich people can send things. I'm going to say that they send the Hulk the Infinity Gauntlet. <laughs> and he just snaps. Thanos right. watching? Oh, yes. Thanos watching. Hey, 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 I think that's fair game. Let's kill. Rich people can send objects. I'm just saying, I don't know if any rich person would have the ability to buy or be able to send in an Infinity Gauntlet, especially after Thanos has you destroyed them. So like, let's go on Amazon know. and order a real Infinity Gauntlet. They oh, can I don't know about that. They can send in a plastic Fact Infinity check Gauntlet. Gauntlet. <laughs> All right, about a minute left. Minute left. <laughs> okay. yeah. They silenced the table. <laughs> well, no, the Hunger Games is not just about power, it's about skill, and mm. it is. So they do the movies. The movies are the books about the desire to kill. Wolverine has the desire to kill. Hulk goes into Berserker Rages, but he makes mistakes. He gets all mixed up. Plus, if he can bring out Banner, uh, if Superman can get to his better human instincts, and then Hulk is also just a Superman. scientist. And again, Wolverine will jump out of a tree and stab him with his claws. Right, and then heals. Superman will heal. You know, no, Superman will heal. Banner, oh. Banner will be. Okay. Will well, yeah, be, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. That's, that's like, all it's, uh, uh, Hulk has lost to Superman plenty of times, and uh, uh, Wolverine has lost to Hulk plenty of times. So if Hulk can beat Wolverine, Wolverine, he's also beaten Hulk. Yes, but no one, uh, none of those two have ever beat Superman. And albeit, may I know those are in the comics, yes. not the movies. Oh, are we talking <laughs> comics or movies or everything but in between? Well, we're talking well, comics. This... I'm going to bring in the Ultimates, where the Hulk just eats people. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, 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 the show is called Movie Fights. Yes. The show oh, is called Movie Fights. Wolverine possesses the combination of skill, kill, killer instinct, and the ability seconds. to win the game. The intelligence, everything I, that you need to win the Hunger Games, is all right there in Wolverine. Absolutely. Same with uh, Superman. Everything you say and if push comes to shove if push comes to shove he can absolutely kill people if he needs to and he has I'm pretty sure he has well in, in, no in the movies he snapped one saying. non adamantium that can also, be cried about it for two movies also the dude is jacked time alright um, you know what
know what? All these dudes are jacked. All right. Uh, like the Brock Lesnar of the world. I, you know what? I, 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 my, my favorite thing about this round, DC, Marvel, coming together, good times. Uh, I Lon, the one person in I don't think you can order a real Infinity Gauntlet online. That's my only fact check Thank you. Thank you for that. You can uh, get maybe a space stone. <laughs> Uh, Juan, please go ahead and chime in. Uh, on, uh, what do you thought? Great, great points all around. Uh, I think Cameron convinced me that Hulk would make the best sartorial choices. <laughs> and I think Tony convinced me that uh, Superman could win if this was just a straight up battle royale. But I thought when you're talking about specifically who would win the Hunger Games, I think Dan went above and beyond really specific arguments about why Wolverine is best poised to win this specific tournament. I'm going with Dan. Uh, yeah, Lon, uh, I, I felt similarly. I mean, uh, D Dan went into, like, just Wolverine was an outdoorsman. He's a tracker. He even uh, went into how he shops at REI. And, um, and there, th we heard a lot about the powers and how, like, jacked your dudes were and, um, and, 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 a lot of, and a lot of good points. But specifically tailoring it, not to sartorial choices, but to the Hunger Games. Yeah, Dan Merle uh, takes this one. Uh, Cameron, Tony. Tony, well played, both of you. I should have picked Spawn. <laughs> Wolverine only shops at Cabela's. That's oh. the only place he will shop. <laughs> noted, noted. That is canon. Uh, oh, uh, Tony, I want to see oh, what you got nice. for us. Fact check, those dudes are oh. jacked. That's right. That's right. Jacked. <laughs> All right. Jack dudes. And uh, right now, we have uh, an old pal with us. We haven't uh, we haven't had him on the show in a while. He hasn't uh, been here, but uh, I'm so thrilled and uh, just touched that he's uh, come down to talk to us and be here today. So without further ado, uh, Mr. Roger Barr. Roger. <laughs> Ah, welcome, pal. Hey, guy. Hello, hello. Good to see you, buddy. You too, Rod. Thanks, bud. Welcome back. Hey, hey. Good to see you, Thanks, Ben. Okay. Um, so, the the reason I'm here is, um, uh, basically, I believe in you know trying to use you know if you have a platform, trying to use it for good. Um, and I haven't been here in quite a while, and um, it's. Um, it's unfortunately kind of a tragic story, but um, I want to uh, tell you guys what happened and explain a little bit for those of you who, who don't already know. The reason I've been gone so long is back in November of 2017, my wife Marie, she, uh, she ended her lifelong battle with clinical depression by taking her own life. Um, she was the love of my life, and I'm beyond devastated. Um, I don't understand how I'm in a world that she's no longer a part of, a world where I can't share all those wonderful laughs and adventures with my favorite person, with my love. That's her on the screen right there. Yeah. Um, she's my best friend. Um, I don't understand why I have to wear her wedding, her wedding rings around my neck rather than stand by her side and hold her in my arms. Um, I'm no longer the same person, and the reality is two people died that day, and I do feel like a ghost. Um, my life has gotten a lot smaller since then, and I do miss all of you. Um, but I'm here again because I wanted to talk to all of you about depression, because it's what she would have wanted me to do. Depression is an awful disease, and having spent over 20 years of my life with her, I saw how often it clouded her mind and lied to her. She was so incredibly brave in her fight against her depression and social anxiety, from trying medications and therapies to exercising and eating healthy and so much more. Her entire life, she confronted all of it head on in a fearless manner, and I couldn't be more proud of her. I admired her so much and I still do and I always will. Um, the fact is, Ree was my hero. Uh, she was the strongest person I've ever known, uh, a hell of a lot stronger than me. Um, she was everything I ever aspired to be, and she made me a better person. Um, but depression is a ruthless liar. All too often it clouded her mind and made her believe she wasn't a good person or cared about or worthy of love. It made her believe she was a burden rather than beloved. It's a disease that lies and ruins lives. It's no longer, it's no different than cancer. And just like cancer, it's a disease that needs to be fought not only by those afflicted with it, but by their friends and families. 
suicide and depression have such a stigma associated with them, and we all need to be willing to talk about these subjects openly. That's the only way those who struggle with severe depression are going to get the help they really need. Think about it. The disease makes those afflicted with it feel lonely enough as it is. Just imagine how lonely people with depression feel when they believe they can't even talk about it with their friends and loved ones. Honestly, it's up to friends and family to bring it up, because those who struggle with depression often don't have the strength to do so. Sometimes it's a victory for them just to get out of bed on any given day. So if you know somebody who struggles with it, or you even suspect they do, please check in with them. See how they're doing. See if there's anything you can do to help. And above all else, listen to them. Really listen to what they have to say. In our 20 years together, Rhea and I talked constantly about her struggles with the disease, and now that she's gone, all I'm left is with is what ifs. What if I'd done this? What if I'd done that? Always wondering what more I could have done to save the love of my life. Say what you will, but I'll always see this as the most devastating failure of my life. I believe it was my, my purpose to keep her alive with my love. And... Uh, I failed to do so. That's something um, I now have to learn to live with, and it's something I have to carry with me, and hopefully I can somehow help other people along the way and make her proud. Helping other people mattered so much to her, and that's one of the reasons why I'm here today, because it's what she would have wanted. I've spent a long time writing an ongoing story about Ree because I wanted the world to see just how amazing, warm, talented, creative, beautiful, and loving she was in life. I also wanted the world to understand just how much devastation the disease of depression can cause, regardless of how truly wonderful or successful a person is. I wanted to share what I've been through during that time as well, so people could understand the collateral damage that depression and suicide does. And I wanted to share the things I've been doing to honor her memory since she passed. As much as I'd like to read that story to all of you today, it would take up this entire show and then some. So I'd like all of you to save the URL that uh, should be on your screen right there. Yeah, i-mockery.com slash re um, and visit it tomorrow or whenever you have time to sit down and read through it. It's not an easy read, but it's an important one, especially if you or somebody you know struggles with depression, suicidal thoughts, or loss. It would mean a lot to me, and I hope it will mean a lot to some of you after you've read it. In closing, I always considered myself very lucky to have an outlet like this show, uh, where I could make such a wonderful audience laugh while performing alongside such other hilarious, talented, like-minded friends debating on behalf of all the movies we're all into. As a, as a comedy writer who spends most of his time in solitude behind a computer screen, I can't tell you how nice it has always been to get out of the house and have some laughs with all of you, including you, just watching. Um, it's always been wonderful conversing with so many of you on Twitter over the years, and I really can't thank you enough for making this weirdo feel a little less weird. Um, I mean, not really, but <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's nice knowing weirdos like myself have good company out there. Um, I miss making all of you laugh, and I miss laughing with you too, but I'm just not there yet. Um, I'm not in any shape to, to debate or anything, uh, and you have plenty of performers here to do just that, and they'll do it better than I probably could anyway. Um, it still hasn't been two years since she passed, and when you lose the love of your life, someone you love more deeply than you ever imagined possible, it's not like there's a simple switch you can flip to return to normal, because normal no longer exists. Still, I do hope to return sometime because I've always been a hopeful person when it comes to the future. So in the meantime, please read that story when you have a chance, keep re in your hearts, take care of your loved ones, and let's get back to having some laughs here on Movie Fights. After all, this is supposed to be a celebration. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks to everyone here at Screen Junkies for giving me an outlet, and thanks for showing your support for me all these wonderful years. I love you guys. Yeah, so I, I just want to thank you for being here. My heart just uh, breaks, and um, and I but know I, you knew Ree. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And but um, to see you having the strength to use this platform to increase awareness and to let people to 
attempt to end the stigma, to uh, encourage people to get help and to, you know, and to reach out. That's so important. And I'm really proud of you. And I thank you so much for being here. Thank you, too. I Thanks appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, and, guys. And whenever you're ready to come back, there's always a spot for you here. You I know appreciate that. it. I know that. Thanks uh, for coming, too. Because, yeah, you, um, you belong with us weirdos. You know? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I'll, I'll be there at Comic-Con. So uh, I'm looking right forward on. to seeing you guys there. Awesome. So. Heck, yeah. Thank yes. you, brother. All right. Thank you, there, everyone. Right. Appreciate well. it. Get back to having some fun now. Yeah, let's talk about some stupid shit now, huh? <laughs> 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 All right, which Winklevoss twin uh, would uh, win in a fist fight? Yeah, there you okay. Go. Uh, it's Cameron, by the way. <laughs> Cameron is the answer. All right. Tyler and Cameron Winklevoss. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right. Oh, so. Uh, I left my drink up there. <laughs> okay, All right. Now we're going to jump back into the fun. Whoa, this is the final round before we go to the speed round to decide it all. Stepping out of the booth, it's oh, JT. No. Two for life. Better be a Kiana question. <laughs> we shall see. All right. The final table at the World Series of Poker. So, uh, here we are. Top two. We'll move on to the speed round. All right. So we're at the last round, and we're uh, changing it up this round. So instead of uh, two, uh, yeah, I, I said that. I'm, I just read what's in front of me. Uh, it was an uh, the two winners move on to the speed round. Here is question number five. Um, <laughs> yes. Take it again, because we have to explain that this change is different. Okay. Uh, two are going to stay this time. Mm -hmm. only I feel like I kind of said that in like three different ways, but well, yeah, we'll say it again. Yeah, you, you know what? One more for safety. Go, okay. Go on. Go to the two shot, Billy, just like so you cut it. Don't backseat direct. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody likes Do you want to fight or do you want to win? Nobody likes that. <laughs> It's a great. I need that. That's what I mean. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, this being the last round to get to the speed round, we got to change it up a little. Flippy do. So instead of uh, eliminating two, we will eliminate one after this round, and then the two fighters left standing. Oh yeah, we don't like standing on this show. Sitting. Uh, <laughs> the two fighters left sitting will move on we, to. We should not have called this last fighter standing. It immediately turned <laughs> off. Last fighter <laughs> sitting. Yeah. Yeah. Already, yeah. The tweets have already been written. What? <laughs> Last fighter seated company. Yes. <laughs> okay. So the uh, the quote unquote worst answer. I hate to say that because we've gotten nothing but good answers mm. this whole damn game. But the uh, the the one fighter uh, will be eliminated, and the final two will go on to the speed round. Y'all ready for this? Let's do this. Question number five. What movie that doesn't have one? would inspire the best ride. John Wick. Fart. Fart. Speed. I'll go with Keanu. Let's, Let's do, do this. Keanu. Okay. Go we have John Wick. We have Speed. And uh, Dan. Uh, Thor Ragnarok. Oh, that's good. Okay. Thor Ragnarok. All right. So we have Thor Ragnarok, John Wick from JTE, and Speed from Sasha. Fight it out. All right, first of all, whenever I go to Universal Studios Disney World, there's always that game like Spider-Man where you get to go and you have a gun, and you're basically on a track, and you're going through, and you're shooting things, and you just don't feel motivated. You're just like, oh, I'm just playing some stupid laser tag. What if you're going through the Continental, and you have a hologram, Keanu Reeves is like, go in there. They killed my dog. Help me. And you're going in there, and you're like, holy crap. Okay, so I got Keanu as my host. I'm shooting people. First of all, every headshot is worth double the points, because that's John Wick fashion. And you're given, like, a little stuffed animal puppy as you enter the ride. And you're basically, your job is to keep this thing alive. There's a sensor on him. All the things are actually shooting at you. The problem with all those other rides is, like, you go in and you can't die. You're just like, all right, I'm just going to shoot and try to get some points. you got to keep that puppy alive. Alive. You cannot let him die. <laughs> That's horrifying. It, That's it's, horrifying. It's 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 horr
best disturbing. way possible. Truly disturbing. Listen, John Wick no, no, no. is in Fortnite. He has broken no. barriers. No. And kids love him. No, 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 Adults no. love him. Sasha loves him. I do love him, but here's the thing. If you want Keanu, I will mm -hmm. give you Keanu. Oh, I will great. give you Keanu with a bomb on the bus. And you have Ooh. a whole busload of people. People who are married with children, have families. They're here just visiting Los Angeles for the first time. They want to have an experience. They don't want to die. They want to die in the hands of a madman. This is like the most incredible go-kart ride you have ever had. It wait, is wait, keep it over is, 50 miles an hour, the wind in your hair, you, Sandra Bullock, but if you're Sandra wait, Bullock Wait, are you now, on a bus though? Yes, you're, you're on a bus and you gotta go fast. You are Sandra Bullock. Everybody I, wants listen, to be Sandra Bullock. I spent so many years on the LA buses, I don't want to go back. I, I finally have a car. The last thing I want to do is go on the same thing that took, I had to get to University of wherever this thing is, I had to take the bus, I had to take the metro. I don't want to go back on because the metro. how fast was that bus going? Was it going over 50? This bus goes fast. This, this is a bus that is going to pay $150 miles. to go to a yes. theme park. I don't want to get on a bus. <laughs> no, me either. I got to get on a bus to get there. Yeah. 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 I just got to get the bus. That's what I'm saying. Ride. The entire There's thing one is a tram ride. There's one part of Universal ride. that's a tram ride. There's, and there's the rest only one tram ride. It's like Thor Ragnarok the ride. What is you go there? across what is this the, ride? the rainbow. It is a fully immersive 4D experience. It's you're a going, VR? You're going, going to Asgard. You're going across the Rainbow Bridge. Wait, you're in on. the arena. Is this uh, like a theater? It's, it's, like, it's Asgard like the Transformers ride. You're moving. You're moving. It's like the Harry Potter ride. You're moving through. It's a 4D experience. It's the entire Thor. You're going different worlds. You go through wormholes. It's fun. It's it's something you can't actually do in the real world. World. I don't want to ride a bus, and that is an insult to John Wick, my friend. John what? Wick would never hand a gun to someone and go, "Here, do yeah. my job for me." Oh, no, 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 John no, Wick no, no. does it himself. That's, that's the whole point of the movie. John that, no, that's Keanu not true. Cannot be your host. Oh, you spoilers cannot, for John you Wick Three. Concierge. Spoilers for John Wick Three. He nope. gets help from the Continental. The whole team is helping him throughout but the movie. But he doesn't have someone else avenge his dog. He would never hand someone else a dog to protect. Number one, he would do that himself. Never, ever, ever put a name on. This is Jeopardy. what happened. Debbie from the, Utah. I need no, your help. No, no, no. This is what happened. <laughs> <laughs> no, first of all, <laughs> as you're working your way through the ride, there's a huge line. And as you find out. Horrible. No, but this is I every, this, a huge line. But what I love is when they give you story as you're waiting to get on. So you're sitting there, you're in a con, and you're like, I can't <laughs> yeah, wait to get on. Story. We've seen the all of a sudden, there's like a news report come on. The local kennel has been robbed. Dogs are running <laughs> rampant. Listen, listen. Thing. You tie it to the end, you get into Keanu's arms. You want to talk about a 4D experience? You're smelling Who's Keanu, Keanu? you're feeling yeah. Keanu is playing Keanu. Keanu, 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 Keanu and then you mm -hmm. skitter across the airplane parking lot tarmac thingy. Do you know this is the most safety. expensive ride you know I've ever heard about? Experience? No I can go ride an actual bus, which is way more than what I know I'm going to get to the end of that ride safely. New experience, it's got to go over 50. When have you ever been on a bus in Los Angeles that went over 50? That's why you have to go to a theme park. I've been for on it. too many buses that go over 50, <laughs> like in a 30 mile an hour zone. Listen, it's not, uh, no, no. I, you, again, <laughs> you can get on a bus anytime. Okay. When can you go yeah. to Asgard? Look, when can you enter is, the arena in the car and fight the Hulk? This is, this is once in a laugh. Now lifetime. suddenly we're in like 15 different worlds. And yeah, it, uh, no. Ragnarok takes place in several How places. You go to a ride and do that. When you go on like the teacup ride, you're in a teacup. When no, you go it's to like Harry Wonder. Land, you are in Alice in Wonderland, and you go to like the Tea Party. There's not the budget for these sorts of things. Sure, there Dan. is. Are you kidding me? This is Disney. They have the budget. They can make this an entire park. It would cost five billion dollars. They make it back in a day. About they a minute left. About a minute left. Well, you know what's what's one what's thing? already huge at Disney? Cars. The Cars ride. Now imagine that bigger with Keanu. It's a speed ride, and you're on a bus. <laughs> and you're chasing other buses. Anybody that goes to a park wants to leave with a souvenir. You get an actual puppy. You get to name. You name what? it as you go on the ride. Yeah. Well, it's a stuff. Puppy. Dude, and then no. at the end of the ride, just like the ET ride, you give the name, and as you leave, Keanu says, "Thanks for saving spot." No. And it's just, it's great. You get to interact with But what if you, you don't, go home. You fail. What if you fail? It's like, congratulations, you killed spot. No, no. no. And I'm not gonna do that. There's a, there's a, no, there's a fail safe. Anytime you're about. To 
to get too low on life. CGI or a hologram cat comes in and saves the dog. 20 seconds. Well, there's no stakes. They, they don't know that. They don't know that. You don't know that going in. You said that we're going to get on a horse and we're going to ride the horse through the streets in New York while we're shooting people. I'm in. That's not realistic. That's not realistic. That's not realistic. I mean, my ride is an actual ride that has a beginning, middle, and end. No, my ride has stakes. My ride has excitement. My ride has romance. My ride has actual Keanu there because you're driving the bus and he's right over your shoulder the whole time. And he's like, you be my wildcat. You're sitting there with an actual there. Whoa. Shocking thing was that uh, JT had a lot more crap to talk about buses than bird scooters. <laughs> I learned my lesson. I got a car. Yes. Um, all right. Some a, a lot of fun stuff right there, you guys. Uh, Daniel Radford, uh, what are your thoughts on this one? <laughs> Um, you know, as much as I want to take my ire out on a bus, um, <laughs> instead, I I think that JTE just kept getting dinged because it, it feels like he would be like, okay, well, they can actually shoot at you. They can't. Not no, real guns. Okay, well, now they're actually going to shoot at you. Well, now they're going to give you a puppy. Okay, but no, it's not a real puppy. And I felt like... The, I said still puppy from the beginning. I felt like the idea of yours kept changing and they kept dinging you because every time then it would suddenly shift and I feel like you didn't have the clearest idea of what your fake Keanu right that you made up in 20 seconds was. <laughs> um... So I have to, because of that, uh, I, have to, I have to say that, uh, that uh, Sasha and Dan will be moving on if it was my call. Uh, okay, uh, Danielle going with Sasha and Dan. <laughs> Yeah, JTE. Uh, I mean, I, I, wow. thought we, I thought we leaned a little too hard into just the preamble before you get to the ride as well. Like, like the Terminator ride has that. It's and, part of the ride. And, and it's just like, what did you say about the ASPCA? Like, there was a like, like the, like the no. pound got loose. It's like, like when you're in the Guardians ride and Rocket's like, I gotta break my guys out here. The, the, a bunch of puppies got loose. The, you gotta go the, the got yeah, loose got, inside yeah. the. Yes, thank you. How, and the puppies are running. For some reason, people want to murder them. <laughs> yes. And then you and John Wick have to team yes. up to save the puppies. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I thought. John was listening. It's you know, definitely the worst pitch out of the three. <laughs> that was the pitch. That was the pitch. Yeah, yeah, Keanu Reeves. You know what? Actual Keanu Reeves. I thought, you know what? Uh, I thought it had a lot of potential, but the dog death was too much of a death. Cat, dude, you can never kill the dog. Have like you cats. not seen I Am Legend? Yes, the, scre oh the, the, the screen. Writing chestnuts oh. save the cat. JTE, I, I love you, but you will not be moving on to the speed round. Thank you, brother. The one episode I don't have the laptop, and it's the most fact based, data intensive. <laughs> All right, here we are. We have reached that time. It is the speed round. So. Right. Um, yeah. We are starting off at zero to zero. Uh, the speed round, this is a best of five. The first person to three points wins this thing, the Movie Fights yeah. Championship belt. Damn, All right. Hard. So again, I, I'll ask the question, shout out your answers. Then once we have your answers, we'll get uh, 20 seconds. You'll get 20 seconds to elaborate in the order that you answered, then 10 second rebuttals. Y'all ready for this? Yeah, sure. Ready for this. Do, do, All do, right. Do, 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 question. Question number one of the speed round, Star Wars or Star Trek? Star Wars. Oh, Star Trek. I knew that. That's why I gave it to you. <laughs> All, right. All right. We heard, we heard Star Wars first from Sasha, Star Trek. Uh, Dan is on deck with that. Sasha, 20 seconds to begin when you speak. Uh, <laughs> as much as I love Star Trek and I feel like Scott Mance is going to be screaming, I think that Star Wars speaks more to the four quadrants. You have children, what? you have, I said, <laughs> you have uh, children, you have adults, you have women, you have men. There is more of a sense of true family in the Star Wars movies. There is more of a sense of camaraderie. There is a brotherhood that is more, that is left out of the Star Trek movies. Star Trek... Star Wars has been coasting off of one game-changing movie that came out over 40 years ago. That's all it's been doing since. There was a good original trilogy, the prequels weren't great, and I don't even know what's going on with these new movies. The spin-offs are hit and miss. Yes, Star Trek has some films in the filmography that aren't great, but it continues to be about big ideas, about humanity, about the relationships between people, not lasers fighting in space, and not big opera. We're a family. 
oh yeah, big ideas like saving whales. Listen, there's better action. <laughs> there is truly game. Do you want to talk about a game changing trilogy? Star Wars continues to deliver time after time after time, and Star Trek continues to just be the cerebral answer. Star Wars continues to be a regurgitation of what it was 40 years ago, time after time after time. Star Trek continues to make new movies with new cast that re reinvigorates the franchise every 20 years. And yes, Saving the Whales is one of the best Star Trek movies. <laughs> time, all right. Uh, Lon Harris. Um, yeah, both great arguments, but I feel like Dan just had, he was ready for this one. He's just got so many, <laughs> so many good, here's, what's, sorry, here's yes. what's relevant about Star Trek, and I thought Sasha didn't really hit him back on the one good movie 40 years ago crack, which is a really good one. I gotta go Dan. Um, yeah, I, uh, I I saw it a little bit differently, because uh, Dan uh, dinged uh, Sasha on uneven uh, Star Wars films, but then uh, Dan um, dinged himself when he said, yeah, some uh, Star Trek films are not that great. And I thought Sasha hit just the, the likability and the action um, that Star Wars has provided over the years. So by a hair, I'm going Sasha. Danielle. Oh. Oh. Man, I, know that you. I love it. Sorry. So um, it's on my shoulders for this one point out of five. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so yeah, both great points. Um, I, I want to, you know, I think that Dan really had it when he mentioned, you know, it was coasting off of one movie, which I didn't feel like Saja had a really great comeback to. Hers was a lot about how cerebral it was and the four quadrants, but I feel like Dan was bringing stuff up that Sasha wasn't hitting down as much, especially like the new movies with the new casts and going off of their old stuff. Um, and so just in the, in the debate version, the debate portion, I've got to go with Dan. All, All right, right, that is one point for Dan. Here is question two of the speed round. What is the best serious Jim Carrey movie role? The Truman Show. Truman Show? Um, the Man on the Moon. Man on the Moon. All right, we have Truman Show. Dan going first with that. Sasha on deck with Man on the Moon. Not only is it a great performance in The Truman Show, but it was that when he had to break out of this thing that people saw him as a funny man and they didn't think he could pull off a dramatic role, he did. And the despair that you have, this guy whose entire world crumbles around him, the way that he's able to bring you into that to play the character of Truman, he plays himself not wanting to give away that he knows what's going on, he's able to play all levels of deception, the absolute sheer terror. To have to tackle an iconic role that is the clown with tears, I think is one of the hardest things that you can ever do. Milos Forman ended up giving us a film that is beautiful, it is heartbreaking, you deal with comedy, you deal with tragedy. It is, he was largely still being the funny guy. When you have to see him in Man on the Moon, you see the true depths of despair that he had to hit in a way that made him Man on the Moon was a brilliant imitation of Andy Kaufman. It is beat for beat an imitation of his greatest bits and his greatest moments. The Truman Show is a fully fleshed, original character that he himself constructed. I think that's more impressive. That's like saying it's easy to play Muhammad Ali. Playing Andy Kaufman is the hardest thing you could ask a comedian to do. And the truth is, is that Truman doesn't make the turn until halfway through the second act. And it really is not that heartbreaking. What you're seeing is a man Time. All right. Also acceptable would have been Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Okay. Oh, yes. wow. um, yeah. Danielle Radford, what are your thoughts on this? Ooh, this was a great back and forth. Good Lord. Um, both of you were able to hit on how heartbreaking he was being and that he had to play on different levels of roles. Dan did great when he mentioned the original imitation and how Truman is an original character. That Muhammad Ali line fought back really hard. It's like, you can't just be Muhammad Ali and Andy Kaufman. You, you, like, you can do an impression, but he like became Andy Kaufman. And it's a really hard dude to do an impression of. You can't just bust him out like a walk-in. I'm going with Sasha on this one. All right, that's one for Sasha. Lon Harris. Yeah, I'm inclined to agree. It was, ne it was neck and neck the whole time, but I thought Sasha ended really strong and uh, parried sort of everything Dan threw at her. I'm also going with Sasha. All right, Sasha. Sasha takes that point. Uh, it Thank is you very much. one one. <laughs> uh, one one. This. That's all. That's all there is to do in any car. Yeah, that's, that's all it is. You know what? Reverse it. That's one line. That's it. Okay. Uh, all tied up at one one. This is a great moment in sports. Uh, question number three of the speed round: Better Batman, Michael Keaton or Christian Bale? Michael Keaton. Okay, Dan with Keaton, Sasha with Bale. Dan, you're on the clock. 20 seconds again when you talk. 
Michael Keaton continues to be the only Batman that is able to be able to pull off both Bruce Wayne and Batman in a believable way. Bale hid behind the where is she? That persona of Batman, and it got so ridiculous by the time you got to the end of it, he didn't even seem like a character. Michael Keaton was able to play Batman. You could see the conflict underneath his eyes. You could see Bruce Wayne underneath that mask, and that's because Michael Keaton is such a great actor. I would argue the person that does the combination of both better is actually Ben Affleck, and I think that there's a strong argument to be made there. But if we're going to talk about the actual Batman, Christian Bale is better has better physicality. He is better in the charisma of being the actual like the the savior of the night. He's the person who you believe can swoop in and actually save you. I can kick Michael Keaton's ass. Are you fucking kidding me? There's not, that's not even a thing. Christian Bale. Oh. I would love to see anyone try to kick Michael Keaton's ass. Uh, he could scrap now, and he could certainly scrap 30 years ago when he played Batman. Bale got lost in the persona of Batman, as whereas Michael Keaton was able to play the role. Bale was able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Heath Ledger. Bale was able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Aaron Eckhart. When you talk about Batman, I'm thinking about Birdman. He's already beat down. He was already, like, tired. He was already playing too much into the comedy. Christian Bale had the pathos. Time. Uh, woo! Uh, some some good stuff right here. You know, um, it, it's not because of this, but Michael Keaton was recently uh, at a college graduation, and he said, "I'm going to leave you with two words." I'm Batman, and like that blew my mind. That did not factor into this, uh, Dan. Uh, um, uh, Dan, uh, I, th I thought I, I thought you just framed the total package um, a little bit better, Sasha. I loved your point about Christian Bale's physicality being stronger, but mm, I just got that much more from Dan. So I'm going Dan, Danielle. Um, yeah, I have to agree, but just because like Sasha did, she had great points about like the physicality, being able to be Batman, but I felt like it was too much too much argument that being Bruce Wayne isn't as important, and I think you have to be able to do both. I think Dan gave me that, so I'm going with Dan. There it is, Dan takes that point. This is do or die. Yes, it is. This is game point. Game point. All right, I mean, Sasha. It's his belt, dude. I don't even want it. It's like, <laughs> that's Dan's don't belt. say that. That's weird. No, wait, wait, wait. This is Dan's belt that's now in my house. No. It's fine. It's you his know, champion's <laughs> belt. You know, it's like borrowing a belt from a friend. Ooh, yeah, yeah. she was my oh outfit too. All right. Yeah, so it really brings it's in your way. Here we go. Question number four. <laughs> now Thank I, you. Now I want uh, it because it was cucumbers. Sasha, you need this to let's tie go, it up. Let's go, let's go, let's go. You need this to tie it up. Come on. Okay, here's a question. What's the best movie with either the number or the word one in the title? One. Best movie with oh, either the number mm -hmm. or the word one. O N E. One. Like. Oh, okay. I got. One. I got one. Wait, wait. Does it have to be? It's. It's. It's, it's on its own. Either the number or the word. Does it have to be? Uh, I didn't write this question. Because, because, like, is Ocean's Eleven technically? Yeah, right. I yes. Say, yes. yes. If no, it's it in a larger number, I think that's okay, right? Yes. If it's in a larger number, Ocean's that's 11. okay. Ocean's Eleven. <laughs> I'm taking Ocean's okay. Eleven. Then, okay. Yes, then I will say Sidney Lumet's Twelve Angry Men. There you go. That's my answer. Okay, we have oh, Ocean's you Eleven. You suck. Well, it's better than what I was gonna say, which was Air Force One. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I was stuck. I was stuck for a minute there. Uh, just, I'll know. just note they left Two Thousand One: A Space Odyssey. See on the table. Oh, yeah. All right. Uh, so uh, this we have. Is, this is what happens when you have 14 seconds yeah. to go. With no the worries. Here we go. So again, right. Sasha has Ocean's Eleven, the uh, the original or the remake. The uh, remake, sir. The remake. The remake. And Dan has Twelve Angry Men. Sasha, 20 seconds begin when you speak. There has never been a more charismatic ensemble put together than what we see in Ocean's Eleven. Steven Soderbergh brought together the best he could, the best he's ever done when it came to both marketability and true artism. He got a performance out of George Clooney that I would say is probably amongst his best. Uh, you have the, all the lush, uh, like fantasy uh, wish fulfillment stuff that you get in Vegas. Ocean's Eleven is a fun crime caper, but George Clooney's playing the George Clooney role. I mean, I would, that's what I would call his role in that movie. Oh, he's playing George Clooney. Twelve Angry Men is one of the most gripping movies ever made. It's able to take 12 people in one room and make that an edge-of-your-seat thriller, and that is masterful filmmaking. That's Cindy Lumet. That is the cast of that movie. I'll go by ensemble versus your ensemble any day of the week. It's one of the okay, best movies ever made. It's your turn. I know. I'm waiting. I have my 10 seconds aren't started yet. <laughs> <laughs> Sasha knows the rules. Suck it!
It's not that gripping. I tried watching it again, and it's really kind of boring. It's absolutely dated. It does not hold up over time. The trick is, is the, the remake was actually, I think, a little bit more interesting. Twelve people in a room. Nobody wants to watch that anymore. I want to see fun. <laughs> I'm sorry that it didn't interest you, but I will take one of the best movies ever made over an interchangeable crime caper. Which casino did they rob? They robbed them in two more movies and a prequel. I'll take one of the best movies, one of the best scripts, one of the best cast, one of the best directors. Time. Made me angry, Sasha. <laughs> <laughs> That's what what angry Dan. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One angry Dan. One angry Dan. Uh, Lon. Is it the Bellagio and the MGM? Yeah, it's around? the Bellagio and the MGM. So. Into. That aside, and as much as I love any rebuttal that begins with a very speedy second <laughs> I think I have to go, Dan, with this one. Uh, there's just so much to talk about with 12 Rangy Men. I think he really covered the gamut of all the great stuff about that movie. I'm going with Dan. Danielle. Um, as classically used in these fights as the suck a <laughs> defense is. <laughs> she ran a classic suck a <laughs> defense. You can't run around it. It's like a Hail Mary. Um, <laughs> and was able to battle his ensemble versus her ensemble. So I have to go with Dan. Dan Merle, you are still the Mary Fights champion of the world! Everybody come back in, come back in! Yes, 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 yes! Oh my gosh, Dan, Dan, you are the The next one is uh, San Diego Comic-Con, always a fun one. And uh, man, you guys, uh, let's all say our uh, Twitter and Instagram handles on the count of three. <laughs> one, two, three. <laughs> <Out of way. laughs> yes. Please follow all of us, uh, Hoot Hoot Owl Nation. And uh, yeah, uh, you guys are the best. Uh, man, this has been so much fun doing it weekly. And I'm so freaking hashtag blessed and lucky to uh, get to do this with such awesome, funny, knowledgeable people. Oh boy. We love you, Hal. We love you, Hal. You guys, uh, for watching and being a part of the fun, and uh, Billy JTE, thank you for holding uh, it down. And Mara, she made us cookies. Yes! yes! yes!